Hi, I'm Ben, and today I'm going to show you my collection of classic Toyotas. Okay, so this is the original one. This is my very first Toyota. I bought this about 15 years ago, back in the UK. This is a 1993 Toyota Land Cruiser LJ70. And it's in its original colour, midnight blue. And it's a soft top. I'll go into a bit more detail shortly, but I'll just show you the other, first, the other cars first. And then we'll come back and go through each one a bit more closely. So next to it is my 1990 LJ78. I actually purchased this one when I was living up in Queensland. And it was a bit of a wreck. It was very cheap. It needed a full respray. It was in a real mess. And I completely restored it. So that was my second restoration. After restoring the, uh, the LJ70 first, I then did the LJ78. So this is a longer wheelbase. Same wheelbase as the 60 series. And it's obviously a five door. And from the A pillars back, it's an identical body near enough to the current 76 series that Toyota still sell. After that vehicle, I then bought my 1994 Hilux and this has been an absolutely fantastic vehicle. This is my workhorse. Yeah, I've taken it for driving quite a few times but its main job is collecting firewood, collecting building materials, taking scrap to the scrapyard, things like that. It's just a really handy vehicle. So no boxes or canopies or any of that on the back. I like to have the tub completely empty so I can uh, fill it up and load it up and move stuff around. So that is probably the most used vehicle on the fleet. It is it's a really handy vehicle. Next we've got my 1995 Celica. Now this is my shitbox. This car owes me about three and a half grand, so very cheap. And I bought this a few years ago just as a cheap run around. And I actually really like driving it. The bodywork is far from perfect. It's been rear-ended at some point, and um, the plastics don't fit properly in the boot, and it's a bit tatty in places. It's it's not a great example of a Celica, but it owes me virtually no money, and I really believe that every fleet should have a cheap car that you don't particularly care about, because it means I can park this absolutely anywhere, and I really don't care if it gets damaged, someone hits it with a shopping trolley, or it gets stolen, or anything like that. The other cars, I absolutely love, but this car, yeah, it's it's a nice car, but I don't love it. It's just my cheap run around and it does the job very nicely. So the last car is my Toyota Blizzard. So this is a JDM import Toyota Blizzard 1986 model, same year as I was born. In fact, this was the same month as I was born. This is a September model. So this is another one I fully restored. This is my third vehicle restoration. And like my soft top LJ70, I built a rotisserie for this body and had it on a rotisserie and then I fully resprayed it myself and um, yeah, got it all nice. So I actually went a bit further with this one because I had the body fully sandblasted while it was on the rotisserie when I was working on it, restoring it. So yeah, so that is my five cars. So. There's a couple more that I really want to add to the fleet. So I'd really like to add a Toyota um, Super Custom, which is basically a high ace van, um, but it was only sold in Japan. And in Japan, it got things like electric curtains. It got really plush seats like armchairs that all recline and fold. Um, they had like three sunroofs in the roof that they call moon roofs and it's just like a, a luxury camping vehicle that the Japanese market got and they also do them in four-wheel drive which is uh, the model I would like. I want a four-wheel drive one as a, a little camper van. I think that'd be brilliant for sort of one or two nights away. Just jump in it, pull up somewhere, you know, pull the awning out and yeah, have beds in the back and I think that'd be a really cool vehicle. And the last vehicle I want to get is a Subaru Impreza GC8. So pre-99 2000 model um, the first you know proper Impreza that's what I really want so they're the two that I'm still going to hopefully add to the fleet one day um, but for now I'm very satisfied and very happy with the uh, five that I've got so they're all on Club Reg which we're lucky to have in Victoria so that basically means 
that the registration or road tax if you're in Europe on these five vehicles works out to less than my wife pays with her 2016 Subaru XV and the insurance also works out cheaper because they're all on classic insurance and limited use because the one thing with the, the, uh, the club registration the club permit is that I can only drive each vehicle up to 90 days a year so each one can only be driven up to three months of the year but when you've got this many it's it's fine you've got enough vehicles to drive every day of the week if you need to so yeah it works really this well this one me. is my 1993 LJ70 Land Cruiser and this is the one I imported from the UK when I emigrated almost 11 years ago so I've had this car about 15 years now and this is the car that I transitioned in from Suzuki four-wheel drives to Toyota four-wheel drives I'd had five Suzuki Vitaras before I bought this LJ and um, yeah I was ready to move on something a bit bigger a bit more powerful a bit more practical and um, yeah this is what I ended up with so I fully restored this and this is probably one of the rarest 70s in the whole country because it's got the later rectangular headlight front that Toyota only bought in in 1990 and they didn't sell many LJ's or RJ 70's in Australia in 1990 they only sold a handful and no soft tops so this will be the only soft top rectangular front 70 in Australia so the front bar I made myself I wanted to I didn't want a ball bar on this car I wanted you to be able to see the face of the vehicle rather than covering it up with a ball bar and the number plate flicks up and we've got the winch fair lead there and there is a winch there I haven't fitted the rope and finished wiring it up but that's in there got a light bar up in there I've got two uh, chunky recovery points on the on the front there and a couple of spotlights and that's pretty much the front end go down the side we've got a set of rock sliders that I um, made myself fabricated them I'm a qualified TIG welder is one of my trades um, so I do all my own fabrication so I also fabricated the rear rear bumper that's all out of three mil steel that I folded again we've got chunky recovery points that I TIG welded on got the exhaust coming out the back I don't like exhaust when they come under the the rear bumper or under the chassis where they can get squashed when you're dropping off rocks and things um, we've got a reproduction Bandera spare wheel cover so these short wheelbase 70s were sold in Australia as Bundera's, that was the model. Bundera is actually a, a rock wallaby in, in Aboriginal. So, but yeah, it was sold as Bundera, so that's a, a nod to what they were sold to in this country. The interior is all pretty standard. Oops. I have made these um, side panels and door, car door trims. They're all made out of... Um, Aluminium that I had powder coated And I've also got this bit of a cage on top. I didn't actually make this um, But I did get it repowder coated. This is actually just aluminium and it's more just a frame to uh, Support the canvas roof that I normally have on it I originally was going to keep it just as a, a soft top and only drive it on nice days and nice weather But I found that I couldn't wash it um, obviously without the interior getting wet so it lives with the, uh, the canvas roof on most of the time but on days like today and in summer I take it off you look on the inside it's all um, it's all got its original 1993 UK interior with the turbo seats the, uh, the centre console with cup holders that not many well, I don't think any Australian models got so that was all standard um, on these soft top models the actual door frames this black window frame around the top they actually unbolt and come off and the same with the back ones, the back ones have actually already been removed and you can see they've got these rubber trims, these rubber covers on the back here and they cover the holes where the door frames were and in the glove box of every one of these soft top 70s when they were sold there's one of these little bags and I was lucky that they still have this as a genuine part, you can still buy this thankfully out of Japan and that's what it's got, it's got numbers and it shows you where all the little parts come go so it comes with a wrench to take the door frames off with and then it's got these little rubber rubber covers oops Jumped on. so it's got these little rubber covers and these the captive nut on these bolt on in place of where the uh, window frames were so they cover up the holes 
to the left when you uh, remove the window frame. So I think that's a pretty cool feature. And the other thing you can do is the entire windscreen folds down. So it's got these big um, nuts here that you can undo by hand. And the, uh, the wiper blades are pretty cool. They've got a screw here and they've actually got a double pivot. So you can fold the windscreen wipers down onto the bonnet. You then fold the windscreen down and there's then clamps to clamp the windscreen down. So you can drive it with all the door tops removed and the windscreen surround folded down. So in standard form, all you would have left is this, uh, this center section, which um, the seat belts mount to. So this is my LJ78 1990 model. I bought this as I realized with a growing family um, that the short wheelbase LJ70 was just too small, especially for camping gear and all the stuff. Um, so this is my camping touring vehicle. I've actually not long come back from Queensland. We took it up to Queensland from Melbourne and um, we crossed over the, uh, the river at Noosa, over to Noosa North, North Shore, and then drive all the way up to Rainbow Beach and all the way up to Fraser Island and across on the ferry to Fraser and had a fabulous week over there for driving. So, and it's also done a lot of high country trips. This has done some of the hardest tracks in Victoria. It's been up Barclay River Jeep track a few times. It's been up Ellis track at the back of Warburton uh, and quite a few other sort of gnarly tracks. So I'll start at the front and run through some of the mods. So it's got a worn 8274 high mount winch, which is a little bit modified, not crazy modified, but it's got the, the bigger motor and it's got the braced um, housing. You just see the braces there on the back. And obviously it's got quite a bit of rope on it. Underneath we've got a um, a steering guard that I constructed many years ago and that's made out of a 8mm sheet of steel that I had the Toyota logo laser cut into. It's also got some of my own recovery points that I made myself at some really thick half inch thick angle. Uh, on the side again we've got my, my homemade rock sliders that I made myself. They've all been electroplated and then powder coated. On the rear, you'll notice that unlike my LJ70, which has got semi-floating rear axles, the LJ78 has got fully floating rear axles. And that's because I blew a rear diff, I blew the factory locking rear diff and decided to upgrade to a 100 series 9.5 inch rear diff with fully floating axles. Um, on the back, again, we've got my own homemade rear bumper. Now this is basically just corners so I copied the standard bumper as best I could but made it out of 3mm steel. It's nice and solid but it's not crazy heavy. I'm not, I'm not really a fan of these Kmart style rear bars with swingaways and all the weight. They're very heavy and I don't like the idea of swinging things out of the way before you can open the door. I had one of those on my LJ70 originally and I hated it. It drove me mad. So um, yeah, so I've just gone with the two bumper corners and the aim of this build was to try and keep the vehicle as light as possible because obviously that is a huge benefit off-road. Um, obviously you're much less likely to break things if your vehicle isn't overloaded and it also uses less fuel and gets further off-road because it's lighter. Anyway, I digress. On the back, I made my own jerry can holder and this was inspired by the jerry can holders that the 70s in the Middle East get. So it's mounted on the little rear door. It retains the original factory number plate light and it carries a 20 litre jerry can. I've got a lock on there so no one can steal it as well as a locking fuel can so it's cap so no one can tamper with my fuel. Just got a, a rubbish bag on the back, pretty standard. Up the top we've got an aluminium roof rack. On this side of the car we've got a shower curtain that folds out because under the bonnet there is a Piranha off-road power shower which heats the shower water using the coolant of the engine and that works fantastically well. On the side and the back we've got two Australian made Super Peg awnings. They're made up on the Gold Coast. At some point I'll probably replace them with a 180 and just have one awning that folds around. So I'll show you where we're at on the inside. So I kitted all the inside out myself 
and there was a few things I was keen to do on this build. When I had my LJ70 kitted out for, um, for four wheel driving and camping, I had my Engel fridge, my 40 litre fridge, up on an MSA drop slide on top of my drawer system. So the fridge sat right up here on a big heavy drop slide. Again, it was annoying, you had to drop it down every time you wanted to get in the fridge and you couldn't see out of the back window properly. So with this build, I was very keen to keep the fridge down low. So that's just on a Piranha off-road fridge slide and that works really well. So that's my 40 litre Engel. The other thing I was keen to do was not fill the entire floor area with, with drawers like most people do. And that was for two reasons. Firstly, I wanted to retain access to this underfloor storage area that the 70 series LJ78, KZJ78 Prado's got. So because these don't have the 130 litre fuel tank that the Australian 76 models got, they have a storage area in there alongside the, alongside the 90 litre fuel tank. So in there I've just got my recovery gear. Now the other reason I wanted to keep an area of floor space free is when I'm transporting heavy things like a bag of firewood or a diff or tools and things like that, it's nice to be able to put them down low rather than having to lift them up higher onto a drawer system and things like that. So this area has proved really handy. I've got a couple of tie down points there on that side and it has just been really handy. So I made all these drawers myself. The actual drawers themselves are all aluminium and then obviously I've carpeted them and put latches on. And you can see I've made use of the space down there. So it appears to be that the, the bottom drawer is full width but obviously it isn't because we've got a wheel arch there. So that's why um, that is shaped like that. So the other drawers are all um, full height. It's got all my um, camping gear in, all my cooking stuff. I haven't actually opened these drawers for months because I've been, uh, haven't really used this cup much. There we go. And then the top drawer, just got a gas stove, cooking oil, mozzie coils, just a few little bits and pieces. Above that, we've got my barbecue plate in a canvas bag. I like to cook on the fire wherever possible. I try not to use gas if I can help it. I'd rather cook on the fire when camping. We've got a fold out table there and then above that we've got the uh, Australian made travel buddy 12 volt oven which is fantastic when we're on trips. We've got a little bit of storage area up the top there and then on this side this is for the dogs. So the dogs go up there and they're nice and happy. I, I don't really like the idea of putting dogs on the backs of utes in, in boxes where it's dusty and hot. I like to keep the dogs in the car with me and air conditioned and they're happy up there, they can stand up, they can look around, they can lie down, they're, they're happy, they love being up there, so that's good. On the back here, I've got a table I made. It folds down like that. And then it can also, that second section can also fold out and we've got the leg up there. So, I don't know if I'll be able to do this one-handed while holding the camera. So that folds out like that. It gives me quite a lot of um, table area when cooking and preparing food. And I just obviously have to put that leg under this end to support it. So I made all that myself, that's all aluminium. And that pretty much covers the back of the car. So I'll show you the interior is... Ah, oh, I forgot to tell you about the um, cargo barrier. So I made this, this is all aluminium. Like I said, the whole point of this build was to try and keep it as light as possible. So I TIG welded all this together. It goes that way and then obviously this way to try, try and um, contain the dogs, keep them safe. So that's all aluminium. And below that is my water tank. So hopefully you can see it. Yeah, there we go. So that's a 55 litre Boab water, water tank. And above it is my high lift, high lift jack. Now I like to keep my water tank in that position because it's right above the rear axle and it's quite low down. So it's quite a lot of weight. It's not right at the back of the car. It's in the middle of the car near enough. Um, so it's a really good place for it. And obviously the high lift jack's heavy. So I like to try and keep that in the middle as well. It's above the axle, so it's pretty good. So that is in there. We've got a homemade roof console up here that I made with my uh, just got a hat holder on the back there. And that's my homemade console. It's nothing flash. It's not as nice as some of those thousand dollars Department of Interior ones, but I'm quite happy with it. I've got a bank of carling switches there. I've got my uh, GME Australian made radio up there. And then I've got gauges up here. I've got Boost, EGT, 
voltage and also a speaker for my uh, UHF radio and what else can I show you um, what else yeah I knocked up a very quick console down here before my trip to Queensland so I wanted to have an oil pressure gauge and also an engine guard which tells me monitors my oil pressure and coolant temperature and all that so that was knocked up very quickly and I will probably get that powder coated so it looks a bit neater. Again, this model got the, um, the factory cup holders, which the JDM market got as well as, as Europe. So that's pretty cool. Um, in here we've got a Doug's tub. That's another Piranha Off-Road product. Um, very handy for keeping all the stuff in. It means you open the glove box and it doesn't just all fall out because it's always loaded with junk, you know what it's like. And we've got a dash mat on the top. Um, which I really like because the dash mats stop a lot of the glare, especially in my Hilux I found that I get a lot of glare. If I'm driving into the sun, the vinyl dash used to really reflect back and reflect back on the screen and it was really quite irritating. So I fitted a dash mat in that car as well and it's cut all that glare out. I don't get glare on the windscreen now off the dash, so that's a, a really good thing. Um, what else can I show you? Ah, the diff locks. So this car came with factory diff locks and I fitted, so it came with a rear diff lock and it had the indicator light for the rear diff lock and I've added a front diff lock indicator um, for my front diff lock. So originally, I, um, when I got this car, the rear diff wasn't working, the locker wasn't working. Um, and on closer inspection, I found actually some of the teeth were broken on the ring gear anyway. So I had that rear locker completely rebuilt with a new ring and pinion which were quite, was quite hard to get because with the factory locking eight inch diff that these got, it's a very unusual size ring and pinion. It's not a standard one. So my, um, my diff guy had to do quite a bit of work to make it all, to make it fit. But he managed to make it fit, fit a solid, solid pinion space. So everything was going great. And then about a year later, the rear diff went bang. I broke a ring and pinion. So that was really frustrating. I'd managed to get the factory locker working and yeah, the rear, the rear diff went bang. So I was, I was really annoyed about that. And I spoke to my diff guy and I said, look, you know, I'm not running hugely aggressive tires. I don't drive it like an idiot. You know, I drive it reasonably carefully, even though I do do some extreme tracks. I, I don't go crazy. Um, why has it blown? And he, he was of the opinion it's because of the sheer weight of the car. It's quite a big car for a little eight inch diff. So he recommended going for the, the 100 series 9.5 inch diff. Um, so that's what I did. Um, so at that point, I fitted a TJM Pro Locker to the rear. Um, I'd previously fitted an Eaton E Locker to the front because the rear locker, factory locker, was an it was an electric locker. So I thought, right, well, I want to keep an electric locker. I'll get an electric locker for the front, and then both front and rear are both electric lockers. Um, but after having that, I realised all the shortcomings with those Eaton E Lockers. The fact that they unlock as you roll backwards or reverse. Um, I actually jacked a front wheel up and measured it and on a 33 inch tyre I've got one third of a rotation of a tyre where the diff is not locked but should be locked and to me that's bullshit. Anyway, so when the rear factory locker, blew, the, the ring and pinion blew up I decided that I would fit a TGM Pro Locker in the back because from all the research I've done the Pro Lockers are the best lockers. Um, I should have mentioned I've actually got ARB air lockers in my LJ70, or air leakers as I like to call them, because over the last 13 years I've had them, I've had so many issues with them leaking internally into the diff. So the compressor just keeps running, it forces diff oil up the breathers, the breather tubes, and it's just a real pain in the arse. And that's despite having those lockers fitted by really highly skilled people who you know have worked at ARB for many years, know how to build diffs, they've built the diffs and fitted the air lockers and I've still got leaks continuously. So I think the front's okay at the moment, but the rear just keeps running. So it works, it locks, but it just runs and runs and runs the compressor, so that's shit. The TJM Pro Lockers, I've got them in the Hilux, we'll talk about that shortly, um, and I've got one in this now, in the rear of this, and I've never had an issue. The Pro Lockers, in my opinion, are fantastic. So yeah, this one has rear Pro Locker, front e-locker the lj has twin arbs um so yeah that's where i'm at with this and on the outside the only other things to talk about we've got a tjm not tjm uh, iron man snorkel had that many years that was originally on my lj 70 but i put it on this car because 
it would not work on that car with the folding windscreen. I want to be able to fold the windscreen and having a snorkel sticking up would not look good. Um, that's actually the reason why the factory raised air intake, we can't call it a snorkel, on the new 70 series Land Cruisers actually pivots in that place. It, it's got a join in that place. And most people don't realize that the whole reason it's got that join is from when it was on the soft top Land Cruisers and the 75 series Land Cruisers so that the windscreen could fold and they've just maintained it to this day even though the current Land Cruisers the screen doesn't fold. Um, anyway, uh, looking underneath the car, this one's got an Iron Man two inch suspension left, uh, not Iron Man, Dobinson two inch suspension left, which I've been very happy with. We've got um, superior engineering adjustable panard rods front and rear. And that's the same on the LJ70. So they're both running Dobinson's two inch suspension all round, and they're both running those superior engineering adjustable panard rods front and rear. Um, I think that's the two Land Cruisers. I can't think of anything else to show you. Um, is there anything else underneath? No, I think that is it. And again, this is running the same size tyres as my LJ70. So this has got the, um, the 285-75-16s. And these are Federal Courageous. Now, these tyres are quite a soft compound, which means they grip really, really well but they also wear out reasonably quickly. So on my LJ70, I used to run BFGs, um, KM2s, but I found that I just don't do enough kilometers to wear them out. So what happens is after 10, 15 years, they're all hard, they start cracking, yet they're still good tight, you know, they've still got loads of tread. You don't actually get to wear them out. Whereas these Federal Courageous, they're softer, they grip better, but they wear probably twice as quick as the, um, the BF Goodridge's, but at least I get to wear them out. I get to use them and wear them down. And then after five years or so, replace them again with uh, another set of Courageous. So when I'm giving people advice on what tires to get, I always say, how many kilometers do you do? Because if you're not doing huge kilometers, you don't need to go for a really expensive tire that will do a lot of kilometers because by the time it gets to those kilometers, it will be worn out, it will be cracked and old and hard just from, from age, you know? So yeah, for me, the Federal Courageous are a really good tire and I've got them on all my cars at the moment, apart from the Blizzard, but that will be getting them at some point. So that is my two Land Cruisers. Um, so this is my 1994 LN106 Hilux. So on the front of here, we've got a TJM bull bar and we've got a flip up number plate again. And a winch in there, that's a worn, I believe. I can't remember now, I think it's a worn. Yeah, worn 12,000 pound in there. With plasma rope and the light bar and a GME Australian made UHF antenna. Moving around the side, we've got the TJM side bars, side steps. And then on the rear, we've also got the TJM rear bar, which I really like. I think it's a really good, solid bar. It offers lots of protection, it's handy for paint stepping on and climbing into the back end, so that works really well. So I bought this car in 2019 and I paid three and a half thousand dollars for it, which at the time absolutely blew me away. I couldn't believe that you could get a diesel four-wheel drive live axle Toyota four-wheel drive in Australia for three or four grand. But that's all they were selling for at the time. And I didn't realize this. If I'd known this, I would have bought one years sooner. But at the time, that's all they were. They were very um, undervalued for what they actually are. Um, so anyway, I bought this from St. Kilda, near the city in Melbourne, of um, a really nice girl. She was selling it for her granddad. Her granddad had bought it new in 1994. He'd had it its whole life. Um, he fitted the TGM bull, bull bar, side bars, and rear bars shortly after buying it and he also fitted a really hideous fiberglass canopy on the back so that was one of the first things to go um, and that's all he really did it was stock standard it was still on its original split split rims and small tires original suspension which is rock hard and really horrible um, and it was pretty yeah pretty much stock standard so I've put a two inch lift on it it's actually a blue max lift which it's not the most expensive suspension lift kit. It's quite a, a budget lift kit, shall we say. 
Um, but I've been really impressed. For what I do, it works really well. So I'm really happy with the suspension I've put under this. Um, yeah, I rate it highly. Um, I went for 31 inch 10 and a halfs on this. Again, Federal Courageous, but I kind of regret that now and I wish I'd gone for the, um, the 32s that I've got on the other cars. So at some point I will be changing these to the same size as I've got on the, um, the Land Cruisers. Um, looking at the outside, I've changed the mirrors. So these are actually 60 series mirrors which in my opinion are much better because they're much larger. I didn't like how small the um, the, fa the factory mirrors um, that came with this car are. They were sort of half that size and to me they were just too small. So yeah, I've drilled the extra hole in the mirror there so I can get the third mounting bolt in. And they're 60 series mirrors. Um, and that's pretty much the outside. And I'll show you the inside. So it's pretty stock standard. It's still got the original sheepskin seat covers that came with the car. Um, but they seem to work well underneath. It's the original vinyl seats, which are in perfect condition. Not the most comfortable, but they, they do the job. At some point, I'll probably upgrade them maybe to some surf seats because they bolt straight in. Um, on the door, I've fitted some of these 70 series um, pockets because this car being the, basically the base model Hilux, it didn't come with any map pockets on the sides um, so I fitted those and that's given me cup holders because it was a bit of a pain not having cup holders just got to remember not to slam the doors um, one thing the Hilux has which some of the 70 series models got in Australia is these little quarter vent windows and these are actually really handy because when you drive in along and you, you open that it gives you really good ventilation you get real good air blasting you in the face so I really like that feature uh, it's pretty stock standard in here. I have made a little console down here just to house the boost gauge, the EGT gauge, the uh, double volt gauge and a double USB down there. Uh, one thing I regret though is fitting SAS gauges. I really regret that. In my other cars I've got VDO gauges and they are far, far better quality. So in future I will be, um, I'll be changing those for VDO gauges. Um, up here we've got the switches, so we've got ARB compressor which is mounted on in the back behind the rear seat and my two TGM Pro Locker switches and then winch in winch out. So on all my cars that have got winches I have a winch power switch and a winch in winch out switch. Um, I really don't like remotes on winches, I would much rather control it from inside the cab with a switch like that. And I also have a switch on the ball bar. So when I'm feeding the cable back in, I can press that switch on the ball bar. Or if I'm in the car winching and driving, I just press that switch. Um, and that works really well for me. Um, I talked in the last video about a dash mat and about the glare. So this has been really good because this, this vinyl dashboard used to give me glare all up here across the windscreen when I was driving into the sun. And that used to really, really annoy me. So yeah, fitted the dash mat and that has made a, um, big difference in the back it's all just pretty stuck standard just got the kids seats and stuff in here um, and that's pretty much that the back's all totally stock standard um, like I touched on earlier I don't like canopies and boxes and all that sort of crap that people bolt on the back of utes in Australia I like to keep mine open so that I can uh, load things in hey, I forgot they were in there they're my bread crates. I actually do um, some charity work on a Friday night and I go and uh, fill the entire back of this car with bread from a, a well-known baker's in Australia and I deliver it to a, um, an organisation that I volunteer for and um, yeah, all the bread that's left over and bread rolls at the end of the day, it all gets loaded into the back of the Hilux and um, delivered to people uh, to use and yeah. So um, yeah, this car actually does a bit of charity work so that's, that's pretty cool. So that is pretty much the Hilux done. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention was future mods. So the other cars are pretty much done. I don't really want to do too much more to them. Um, the LJ78, I do want to do that awning that I mentioned, that th uh, 180 or 360 awning to go on the roof. I do want to do that. And that's pretty much it for those two cars. They're pretty much finished. And the only other thing I want to do on my Hilux is I want to fit a twin transfer box. So Marlin Crawler in the US uh, invented the concept of bolting another transfer box behind the existing transfer box, so you end up with two transfer boxes. 
and that's what I want to do. So my mate Alex, who has very kindly let me use his beautiful property here today to um, display my cars, he's done that to his Hilux. So he's, he's done that second transfer case behind his, and he's also put super, super low gears in the second transfer case. So he's got two transfer boxes, one with super, super low gears, and it's a, it's a weapon. It's absolutely amazing. The thing will just crawl along, inch, 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 like super slow. So you're going up rocks and rock steps, you don't have to slip the clutch and rev it and, you know, bounce your way up. You literally just crawl up stuff. So um, yeah, that's, that's one thing I'm going to do to the Hilux, so at some point I will be importing all those bits from the, uh, the States and hopefully Alex will help me uh, fit them all in my transfer box. I've actually got a spare transfer box ready to go. Um, so yeah, hopefully he'll help me do that and uh, then my Hilux will be my, uh, my rock crawler. So that, that's uh, pretty exciting. Okay, so number four, the fourth car. This is my uh, 1995 Toyota Celica. So it's a 2.2 litre petrol, naturally aspirated, no turbo, and it is just a really bog stock standard Celica. Um, a bit like the Hilux, in my opinion, these are really undervalued and underrated. Like sure, it's not a performance car, it's not a Supra or anything fancy like that, but in my opinion it looks pretty cool, I quite like it, it looks sporty. Um, it's really nice to drive, it's got plenty of power, plenty of torque, it's smooth, it's comfortable. Um, the boot isn't massive, but that's not an issue. Um, the only real negative I would say is it's quite low. So getting in, and, getting in and out can be a little bit of a challenge. You certainly uh, you feel it when you're getting in and, in and out because it is so low. Um, it's an auto, which for me has been really handy because it means my wife can drive it because she only drives autos. So having a second vehicle that she can use if hers is in getting serviced or anything like that has been really handy. Um, this is the only auto vehicle I own, all my others are manuals. Um, I, wouldn't, I wasn't specifically looking for an auto, I would have probably preferred a manual, but this was auto, I think it was two and a half grand, back in uh, 20, 2020 or something I think, 20, yeah 2020 or 2019, no 2020, yeah so it was two and a half grand, and I spent about a grand on it, it had to get some new tyres and rear shocks and a few other bits and pieces before I could register it. Um, but yeah, I really like it. It is my cheap ship box. It owes me three and a half grand and I can park this anywhere and not worry about it. My other cars, I love. My, my four four-wheel drives, I really love. They're my passion, I love them. This car, this is just a cheap car. I can park this anywhere and not care about it. So, you know, even if I was to win the lottery and have, you know, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all the nice cars, I would still want a cheap ship box on my fleet. I, I think there's a real value in having a cheap car that you can park anywhere, that, you know, it doesn't matter if it gets stolen, it doesn't matter if it gets damaged, you know, it's just a cheap car. A disposable car, I guess you'd say. So, yeah, that is the Celica. So, the final car to talk about is my 1986 JDM Import Toyota Blizzard. So, this is a factory turbo diesel, and I re 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 um, restored this last year. So I had the body on a rotisserie, had the body all sandblasted, and then I painted it all myself. This is KTM Orange, um, two pack paint. So I painted it all myself and then polished it all up. These are the original factory decals that one of my friends uh, reproduced for me and he did a fantastic job. So really pleased with that. I think it's a nice feature and um, yeah, it really sort of finishes the car off nicely. So above that, we've just got the Blizzard badges um, so that's that on the back there's also another sticker that he reproduced for me so that's the original blizzard sticker on the back there that he he also reproduced um, I've obviously had the windows tinted I like all my cars to have tinted windows it keeps them a bit cooler and gives me privacy they're the original blizzard mud flaps I just got a white paint pen and redid the uh, the lettering because it was all quite faded. So on this car, I've fitted um, Tough Dog suspension. I was very limited on what suspension was available for this car. It was EFS and Tough Dog, and yeah, I went for Tough Dog, and so far I've been quite happy. So like my Hilux, this is Leaf suspension front and rear. But being such a short wheelbase car, it is really choppy and not the most comfortable or the nicest to drive. 
but I love it. It's a fun car. I don't do huge trips in it. You know, I'm normally only driving sort of 20 minutes, half an hour to work or wherever I'm going, and it's just a fantastic car. So while the body was off being um, sandblasted and painted and all that, I obviously painted the chassis and did all that, and I also made my own three inch mandrel bent stainless steel exhaust. So on all four of my four wheel drives, I've um, made my own three inch mandrel bent stainless steel exhaust on all of them. Uh, TIG welded it all together and yeah, sounds good, looks good and should hopefully last forever. So that's pretty much the outside of the car. Uh, the only other thing I was going to talk about was the PTO winch. So these cars, some of them came with a factory PTO winch and I have a PTO winch for this car which I've uh, fully rebuilt. So at some point I'll be um, fitting that PTO winch to the front of the car and making my own ball bar for it to, to house that winch. Um, so I'm probably not going to put any tube work on it. I don't want to obstruct or block the front view of the car. I really like how the front of the car looks, but I'm keen to fit that PTO winch. So I'll show you the interior, which all looks pretty stock standard. So you can see I've got the turbo stitching on the seats. When this car left the factory in 1986, Having a turbo on a car was a real, real selling point. It was a real feature. It was like, wow, this car's got a turbo and Toyota wanted you to know it. So they put a Toyota badge, a to turbo badge on the front grille, a turbo badge on the engine, a turbo badges on the seats, turbo badge on the rear door, turbo badges on the two side, stickers on the two side doors. So, and turbo badge on the, on the dash, um, you know, on the rev counter, the rev counter says turbo on it. So they really wanted you to know that this car had a turbo. It's just, you know, ridiculous how many badges and stickers said turbo, but that's what they did. Um, so anyway, it's all pretty stock standard in here, apart from I've added a, a pod on the top here for my EGT and boost gauge. And I think that looks pretty neat. It doesn't obstruct, obstruct my vision when I'm sitting here. I can still see all corners of the bonnet, but I've got my VDO gauges there for boost pressure and exhaust gas temperature. Um, I like to have them on all my cars that are turboed. I like to have those gauges there just to monitor how things are going, how hot it's getting going up hills and how much boost um, I'm running. You know, if, if I ever get a boost leak, a hose splits or blows off or something like that, or in the case of my um, LJ78 Land Cruiser, the turbo on that, the actual housing cracked below the wastegate. And I noticed it, not just because I was down on power, but because I wasn't making any boost. So the gauge was showing me that I was down massively on boost. And eventually I diagnosed it and pulled the turbo off and found that, yeah, there was a, a crack in the housing and the boost was just making it, it was bypassing the wastegate and not building boost pressure. So in my opinion, an EGT gauge and a boost gauge is really valuable on a, um, an older turbo diesel four wheel drive. Um, so that's that. If we look down here, we've got obviously got our low range stick and our gearbox stick, but then we've also got another stick that says pull on. So that pulls up and down and that is for the PTO winch. So you just pull it up and that engages the PTO winch. And I've got the shaft that goes all the way to the front for that um, PTO winch. And I've fully rebuilt the winch. I've got 100 meters of plasma rope to go on it. So I'm keen to get that mounted on the front of the car. I think it's gonna look really cool. And it's it's a quirky feature, you know, not many cars came with PTO winches and there's certainly not now many cars come with them. Um, so yeah, that's a cool feature. So I'm keen to get that fitted back on. Um, Long-term modifications on this car. I wanna be able to set a rock sliders for it, a bit like I've got on the other cars. Um, obviously a ball bar for the front to house the PTO winch. Um, when these cars were fitted with the PTO winch in the factory, what they basically did was kept basically the standard bumper, at least it looked the same, and then all they did out the front here, they had this great big thing that came around there, like here, like a winch tray, and it stuck out the front of the car like bloody half a metre. If you see pictures of them online, or in the, I've got an old sales brochure from Japan showing these cars when they were new, and that PTO winch on the front looked absolutely ridiculous because it stuck out like half a meter. I'm not really sure what they were thinking. It certainly uh, wouldn't enhance it off-road. You know, you'd have the winch to recover you for off-roading, but um, yeah, it would certainly be detrimental to its uh, off-road ability. You'd lose a lot of um, approach angle and 
uh, and that with this winch sticking out so far on the front of the car so yeah I certainly will not be uh, keeping that looking factory because yeah I hate it so yeah we'll make I'll design and make a bull bar for that to house the PTO winch that I've rebuilt and do the rock sliders and that's pretty much it I've got one other tiny little modification I'm going to do which I'll show you in a second where's my rear, rear door unlocked so in the back here that's the factory rear seat you can see there and below it is this huge cavernous gap so it goes the whole length of the car and that's a good i don't know a good eight inch gap so what my plan is is to build a drawer system with two drawers one side by you know drawer side by side that fits under that rear seat and actually opens into the car so i can put my recovery gear in it now I can't have it opening backwards into the car because I've got the um, the children's seatbelt um, straps coming down. The child restraint points are down there on the bottom, so I can't have a drawer that opens backwards into the boot area. But also, I often have the dogs and stuff in the back here, so um, I don't really want a uh, a drawer coming back. But I think a um, two drawers coming out this way into the, the back area of the car, and then I can put all that recovery gear, first aid kit, all those bits and pieces in there, a few tools in there, in those drawers, and that'll, um, I think that'll be really good. So that is pretty much it. I think I've sort of covered everything that I wanted to show you guys today. So yeah, hope you've uh, enjoyed my little video and enjoyed seeing my old Toyotas. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can add these other cars that I want to add to the fleet. In the coming years and yeah maybe i'll do another video one day once i've got my subaru and got my super custom camper van um yeah i'll do another video and show you the uh, the updated fleet so thanks for watching